welcome back to Faith Evolving. Today we're going to be asking the question, does Christianity breed conspiracy theorists through analyzing the QAnon phenomenon and the notion of blind faith? So for those of you who have no idea what QAnon is, it's an unfounded, baseless, continuously proven false theory that there is a covert ring of pedophiles and Satan worshippers who drink the blood of children run by the government and big media and Hollywood and Donald Trump is secretly fighting them. Yeah, that's what it is and millions of people actually believe it. Another thing about QAnon is it's kind of a vacuum that like sucks up a bunch of other conspiracy theories. And so it creates this like web of lore, kind of like a big game of D&D &D that puts people's lives actually in jeopardy. Isn't that fun? It began in October, 2017 on 4chan, which kind of has the energy of an alt-right Tumblr. And it was a series of posts from this anonymous person named Q after the highest ranking clearance level in the military. Update, one of my coworkers sent me a link to an article this morning that they have some leads on who Q might be. So I've linked that article in the description. Another big kind of like early QAnon thing is Pizzagate. When a guy like stormed a pizza place because he thought there were a bunch of children being hidden in the basement. So that's the kind of energy that QAnon cultivates. There's been a huge uptick 700% in fact, in people who are searching QAnon since the pandemic because everybody is online, that's where their communities are right now, people are restless, and it's something that could possibly give them answers to why everything sucks right now. You know, this whole idea of searching for certainty amidst the uncertainty that we've seen throughout this past year. Now, QAnon used to have that whole like Reddit aesthetic, you know what I'm talking about? This kind of energy. But fairly recently, it's gone through this whole rebranding. It's very palatable with these like soft color palettes with the same vibe as those cute little like Instagram infographics. And they've been using the hashtag save the children because who doesn't want to save the children? You're gonna see that and be like, which children are we saving? And then you get sucked in. And it's a way for the message to get out on mainstream media since there's been a lot of cracking down on QAnon type hashtags and QAnon searches because it's putting people in danger. And another really interesting thing about it really like booming on social media is that they've gotten like influencers in on it because it's almost like a life hack on how to get more interaction on your posts. They notice that, oh, these hashtag save the children posts are getting a lot of likes, getting a lot of comments. If I do that, maybe I'll get more followers, maybe I'll get some brand deals. And next thing we know, armed insurrection. <laughs> this save the children hashtag is actually riddled with misinformation that actually so many people are calling into these places that are trying to fight real happening child trafficking but with the influx of calls that they're getting from QAnon it buries and bottlenecks the people who have vital information about people who actually have been reported missing. So the big thing with the QAnon phenomenon, which is bonkers fun to say for how terrifying it is, is that it's almost like this addictive hysteria that then brings people further and further down the rabbit hole into thinking that Joe Biden ate six children for breakfast this morning when he literally is just a moderate Democrat and we want our $2,000, Joe. However, this surge in QAnon is fairly recent. And so we really need to be looking out for it in this next year because their catchphrase is where we go one, we go all, and they have two in Congress. Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Georgian Congresswoman in the House of Representatives, is a confirmed QAnon supporter. And the other is Lauren Boebert, who is a Colorado Congresswoman in the House of Representatives. And one of the articles I read was saying that there are others that are Q curious, which I think that that phrasing is really funny, um, even though the topic, again, is terrifying. Because another thing to look out for is the FBI has named QAnon as a potential domestic terrorist group. Yet in the immediate, how it is very alarming and can affect you and me and regular people right now is the outright denial and rejection of the COVID-19 pandemic being real. There are theories that Bill Gates just created it for fun, I guess, because he was bored, that it's bio warfare that only pedophiles get and it's a way to expose them and to kill them. <laughs> I really don't think 
that there are this many pedophiles? And if you do, then <laughs> another thing that the vaccine, they're just implanting a microchip in you, even though you have a microchip in your phone that tracks you already, they don't need it. They don't need it. We already have the Patriot Act. Much like the Netflix show by the same name, the Patriot Act is no longer running. However, unlike Hassan Minhaj's masterpiece, the surveillance laws got renewed under the USA Freedom Act. And these conspiracy theories threaten people's lives, especially the lives of the people who buy into it. But the thing that breaks my heart about QAnon is the amount of parallels that can be seen to Christianity. There's this whole, you know, I need a hero kind of thing, but instead of a savior in Jesus Christ, whose style is nonviolent, instead the impatience and elevating Donald J. Trump to savior status, to kick the ass of the corrupt, as if he isn't one of the corrupt. There is an evangelism aspect to it. In Christianity, there's often a doctrine that you have to bring people to the faith to save their souls from eternal damnation. Within QAnon, there's this idea of red pilling, of knowledge that would not previously been known because you have to take this pill like you're in the matrix because it's a fantasy world and then you hashtag take the oath swearing allegiance. Sounds a little bit like accepting Jesus Christ into your heart, otherwise you'll go to hell. Not me obsessively praying the Jesus prayer from ages like 11 to 15 because I wasn't sure if it had worked. Maybe I'm a little salty. <laughs> and then finally, some sort of big event, like a surprise party from hell. At QAnon, there's the storm when all of the cannibals are gonna be found out and they're gonna be locked away. In Christianity, there's the, what I believe to be a false doctrine of the rapture where, you know, the good ones, they're taken up. Everyone else, you're left on earth to hang out with the cannibals, I guess. In QAnon, there's the Great Awakening. Didn't we already have two of those? The third Great Awakening where, whoa, Oh, everyone's gonna see that Q is right all along. And in Christianity, there's the second coming of Jesus where, whoa, you're gonna see that we were right all along. That's what, that's what my faith is about, proving you wrong. But how did we get here? Get here? Fellow Christians, I propose it was blind faith a refusal to question one's beliefs. Because much of Christian faith formation operates out of this line of thinking. It's taking things at face value instead of diving in and questioning and challenging your own views because doubt is demonized. And so, so many Christians are falling prey to things like QAnon because of our failure to teach that faith and critical thinking can coexist. Let me tell you a little bit about faith formation done right before I get angry again. In this book, Cultivating Teen Faith, it looks at the data and the research done in the Confirmation Project, which looked at faith formation and faith development in five denominations in the United States. And I think there was some stuff in Europe in the research as well. And some of the significant overarching patterns that they found that faith formation and Christian education aren't about saving souls. It's about strengthening one's faith if they want to be in the faith. And that's done through asking questions about what faith is, how to possibly have faith, questions about God and who God is, and questions about why we do the rituals that we do, and developing your own point of view, your own perspective on why these things matter to you, if you want them to matter to you. And there's no magic curriculum. It's supposed to be tailored to the students' interests and to the questions that they ask to make it relevant. And that requires creativity and adaptation, which to me, I think is exciting. Like, I, I would want things to change. I would want to, like, help foster a questioning spirit and someone that I'm mentoring. I'll be like, oh, you have questions? Let's look it up together. Cause like, I might not know. I'm curious too. To me, faith formation and Christian education should be less about indoctrination and more about the spirit of learning without an agenda. And now in this book, Children, Youth, and Spirituality, one of the essays, Yearnings, Hopes, and Visions, talks about five yearnings of youth. And the youth in question that this study was done on at the time were people about my age. So older Gen Zers and younger millennials. And what they found was that 
Youth yearn for the holy, or at least just something bigger than themselves. They yearn for community, to understand the world, to make a difference, and for ethical guidance. And all of these things can be found outside of Christianity, but they can also be found inside of Christianity. But I argue that Christian education in the form of indoctrination preys on these yearnings by promising simple solutions to these really complex yearnings. And nothing does this better than Christian schooling slash homeschooling. And now here, I'm not really talking about like Catholic and parochial schools. I actually went to a Catholic high school and we had, you know, normal math class, normal history class that had nothing to do with Christianity really at all. There wasn't really any bias in those subjects that I found. The big difference was we had prayer in the morning, we had to take a religion class each semester, and we had mass sometimes. I'm talking about the schools where religion is baked into every single subject, especially history and science. These evangelical curriculums are riddled with disinformation. For example, one of the popular curriculums that creates textbooks is BJU Press, which is in conjunction with Bob Jones University. And in their textbooks, they blame Obama for the racial divide in our country and also Black Lives Matter for driving that racial divide further rather than them exposing the racial divide. Another one is a Becca, which is in conjunction with Pensacola Christian College. And in their textbooks, they call globalism, postmodernism, and environmentalism immoral ideologies, which is an incredibly biased way to talk about ideologies. I'm in a college ethics course taught by a literal pastor, and there is intentional effort to not use biases when talking about ideologies. They name Nelson Mandela as a Marxist agitator who drove radical affirmative action, aka ending apartheid, I guess? Are we arguing that ending apartheid was wrong? They repeatedly condemn LGBTQ plus people in their textbooks. I think we probably saw that one coming. And speak about slavery solely in economic terms instead of the gruesome moral atrocity that it was. That's the thing you call immoral, not environmentalism. <laughs> so this notion of rewriting history that they often accuse people of is just projection. That's what they're doing, is rewriting history. They criticize the 1619 Project, which is an initiative to tell the story of American history through the very real, very factual historical thing that happened of slavery and how it's affected everything, yet celebrate the 1776 Commission, which was an initiative for patriotic education, aka nationalism. How do you listen to that and not hear nationalism? Like, Nazi Germany level nationalism. Why did it sound like I said Germany instead of Germany? Yeah, it was gross, but learn how to enunciate, my darling. From essentially only a white perspective. But as Mary Miller will tell ya, you gotta start him young. Hitler was right on one thing. He said, whoever has the youth has the future. So when we see bowed heads in prayer alongside Q sent me signs at an armed insurrection, a literal act of treason, remember this nationalism often starts in our pews, in our schools, and in our homes. Whew, I'm a little nervous. I kind of sounded like Tommy Lauren there in my tone of voice. It's not about how much we love our guns, it's how much we love the people we protect with those guns. <sighs> so angry all the time. Anywho, like this video if you want more people to see it. Contribute more to this conversation that I started asking the question, does Christianity breed conspiracy theorists? Down in the comments, I would love to hear what you have to say. I think there's going to be a lot more videos about QAnon in the future and its ties to Christianity because I don't see that problem going away. And then subscribe, you know? Um, I work really hard on these videos and I like having people see them. Bye!